here we are in Genesis 47 through 50. And then um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of our Torah portion, Vayaki, uh, which I, I, I have kind of broken up into three, I think, main categories. Grafting, prayer, and prophecy, which I think are kind of some interesting overarching themes uh, happening in this Torah portion. So the first thing is in Genesis 47, there's just a couple of verses uh, at the end of 47, which speaks about Jacob uh, living, and he lived, Vayechi is the name of this Torah portion, he lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years, and at the end of that section, he demands that his sons, he extracts a promise from his son Joseph particularly, do not bury me in the land of Egypt. Uh, you know, take me to the land of my fathers and bury me in the uh, cave at Machpelah, at Hebron. And so he does, uh, Joseph does promise his father that he will do that, and that will actually happen in Genesis 50. So in Genesis 48, uh, Jacob meets with Joseph and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, to bless the children and uh, graft them into the family. And he also teaches us a little bit about prayer in that section. And I know that I have mentioned this to you before, but I think it definitely bears repeating, and we'll get into that in a few. Uh, Genesis 49, this is Jacob gathering his, uh, his sons and saying, gather around me and I'll tell you what will happen in the end. Mm -hmm. It's a most mysterious passage and section which is it's very very unusual um, and we'll read through a little bit of that and, and take some prime exemplars from that section because it's just it's really challenging uh, and then in Genesis 50 Jacob does die and a grand funeral is held in the land of Canaan and so what I want to start with is I want to read with you uh, Genesis 48 because I think the, uh, the bulk of the stuff that is, it is particularly applicable and powerful for our instruction comes, I believe, from Genesis 48. And so I want to read that with you, if you don't mind. So in Genesis 48, starting in verse 1, it says, A while later, someone told Yosef that his father was ill. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Yaakov was told, here comes your son Yosef. Israel gathered his strength and sat up in bed. And Yaakov said to Yosef, El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, saying to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous. I will make of you a group of peoples, and I will give this land to your descendants to possess forever. Now, your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be as much mine as Reuben and Simeon are. The children born to you after them will be yours. But for purposes of inheritance, they are to be counted with their older brothers. Now as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died suddenly, as we were traveling through the land of Canaan, while we were still some distance from Ephrat. And so I buried her there on the way to Ephrat, also known as Bethlehem. Then Israel noticed Joseph's sons and asked, Whose are these? And Yosef answered his father, These are my sons, whom God has given me here. And Yaakov replied, I want you to bring them here to me so that I can bless them. Now Israel's eyes were dim with age, so that he could not see. And Yosef brought his sons near to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Yosef, I never expected to see even you again, but God has allowed me to see your children too. And Yosef brought them out from between his legs and prostrated himself on the ground. Then Yosef took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near to him. But Israel put out his right hand and laid it on the head of the younger one, Ephraim, and put his left hand on the head of Manasseh. 
he intentionally crossed his hands, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Yosef. The God in whose presence my fathers Avraham and Yitzhak lived, the God who has been my own shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has rescued me from all harm, bless these boys. May my name be upon them, and likewise the names of my fathers, Avraham and Yitzhak. And may they grow into multitudes in the midst of the land. When Yosef saw that his father was laying his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him. And he lifted up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head and place it instead on Manasseh's head. Yosef said to his father, Don't do it that way, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know that, my son. I know it. He too will become a people, and he too will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he, and his descendants will grow into many nations. Then he added this blessing on them that day. Israel will speak of you in their own blessings by saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Israel then said to Yosef, You see that I am dying, but God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your ancestors. Moreover, I am giving to you one Shechem more than your brothers. I captured it from the Amorites with my sword and bow. Wow, that's strange. Isn't it? <clears throat> Isn't it very strange indeed? So here, as I am wont to do lately, I will point out to you a couple of um, a couple of differences and similarities in this text that I want us to uh, to discuss. Now the first thing is, and I didn't read this to you, but in Genesis 47:29, uh, it basically says that Joseph met with his father, and he his father demanded that he place his hand under his thigh and swear that he would not bury him in the land of Egypt. And we've obviously heard this before. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, Abraham and uh, Eliezer when he sent to find a bride. Uh, and we discussed previously the significance of placing the hand under the thigh, that that's a euphemism for the male reproductive organ and that it has something to do in a mysterious mystical sense with the seed of the nation that would issue forth from there. Uh, and I would ask you, um, you know, whenever you see something that's so strikingly similar in a piece of text, it bears to balance them out and say what are the similarities and the differences between these things. Um, look, look at the promises that were extracted from these two men. Abraham said, do not, under any circumstances, take my son to the land of the Arameans. And Jacob says to his son, do not, under any circumstances, bury me in the land of Egypt. Of Egypt. Yeah. Bury me in the land of Israel. What, uh, what do you make of that? Do you see any... I mean, obviously, we can see some similarities. What, what, what do you think might be the spiritual significance of something like that? Do you have any ideas? Jimmy? It has to do with eternity. The, 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 this vow that you're taking has to do with all of my progeny, mm. uh, and, and it is an eternal, eternally significant yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, one... One seems to have to do, in the case of Abraham uh, gaining a son for his, his, his uh, a bride for his son, excuse me, seems to be the, the remember that this is, the, that Abraham and the, the bride for his son Isaac is about starting the nation, about life, about the seed coming forth to bring forth sons. This one is death. I'm dying, but don't bury me in this land. Bury me there. So one seems to have to do with life, and one seems to have to do with death. Okay. Almost like bookends. Um, a promise, perhaps. What do you think of that idea? Do you, do you see maybe some spiritual significance to that? Michael? I'm sorry, I'm calling you out. I've reverted back to my teaching days. You find the student who looks the most asleep and you say, no, I'm kidding, no. I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, no, I, I, Tracy.
firstborn son that was called out of Egypt, and that's prophetic yeah. there as well. So I mean, it could be um, as far as the embodiments of Israel as a people yeah. being represented in him. Right. That saying, "Don't leave me in Egypt. I'm I'm coming out." Right. You know? Yeah. Because then we see later that people that came out of Egypt want to go back in. Right. So, right. And these are Israel. Yep. Is Israel. Good point. It reminds me of when we take a vow, we put our hand on the Bible. But this is such a bizarrely personal thing to do that I think most people would say, you know, just take my word for it. <laughs> you know, we're good. Yeah. It's no. just strange. Yeah, it is. It is, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely unusual. But I, I would say just, you know, make a note of that, you know, highlight your text or something and say that's, that's an interesting nugget for further study. Angela? Mm-hmm. And um, it's interesting that both of those thigh events have to do with that. And then what we just talked about, I know we, we, we've done some speculation on who that 70th person was. Mm -hmm. um, we did a study maybe a couple years ago on the layout of the temple and the list of those names and who was left out and how the count fits and match. And I think, I, I suspect that that 70th person might be the seed of the woman, which goes back to your very first prophecy in Genesis, mm -hmm. that the seed of the woman mm -hmm. will, and what he says to the serpent, the seed of the woman will strike the head, you will strike the heel, and that, that all this is about that, that seed of the woman, that, and, and that we know that's Messiah, mm -hmm. and that it was, Messiah was with them, but not in a, not yet. Physical manifestation yet, but mm -hmm. he was there in someone who was on the way. Who yeah. So yeah. I suspect that. I have no idea. No, I, I, I think that's very, very interesting, and I, I think it's fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, yeah, like I said, that's that's there's some interesting spiritual potential wisdom here, but it's it's a hidden one. Yeah, having to do with Messiah, he he didn't have a natural born father mm. seed. Mm -hmm. It was only the seed of the woman. And, uh, the blessing for the sons, they had an Egyptian mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I had an interaction with Daniel Lappin over the Internet that he, all he would do is say, no, you're just wrong. That's not true. <laughs> he's, kind of, he's kind of authoritative. He, he just wants you to ask him questions and do what he says. It's that British accent. Yeah, so um, South Africa. But um, it's obvious that the human beings get their spirit through their father. Because if Messiah had gotten his human's fallen spirit through his mother, mm. he would have been a sinner like anybody. Mm. So that had to be broken. And it's, it's just so apparent here that um, this is a proof text mm. that um, paternity... Um, designates a person's spiritual life. Most Jews would very much disagree with you. Yeah, they don't like that at all. They can't, they can't argue the point. They'll just say, no, that's just wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we talked about that, sorry, we, we talked about that when we were doing the little study of Nehemia, uh, I think, to kind of see where that yeah. origination came from. I'm going to go to Tracy and then Mike. Mike first. I was just going to say, there's mention about Yes. Oh. Yes, indeed. I don't know if you heard that, but Mike said there's also the the the, uh, the swelling of the thigh and the woman with the test of the bitter waters in the temple, and then that's another perhaps element to stick in there to begin to balance those three ideas. It might be very interesting, Tracy. Mm. Yeah. And that's kind of I was going to say something else about the thigh as well. I don't know if it will make any sense of anything, but that same word is used in the center shaft for the menorah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Which represents the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The servant. Candle. The servant. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Wow. So Interesting. There's probably some kind of symbolism. There. Yeah. Look it up. His like in Revelation, who knows what the word is? His name on his thigh. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, there's something there's something there. I I we're, I think we're we're kind of hinting around yeah. the edges of it. Uh, I don't know what it is. We need to kind of look at it a little bit deeper, Mike. And I don't know if there's anything else to tie any of this together, but at the end, the, the very last piece of this chapter and the fulfillment of Joseph's dream about his father Balak, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But not his mother. <laughs> his mother's dead. Gracie. Please. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's a euphemism uh, again. Uh, in that text, it says the literally the thigh in the text because that's always a euphemism for the uh, reproductive organ. And so, yes, a lot of translations in the English. What's that? No, it's not. But in the in the English text, it will often say the belly will swell because they're more closely associating it with the woman's. Uh, reproductive organs, which are inside the belly, mm-hmm. so to speak. So it says the belly shall swell and her thigh shall rot. Right. Okay, belly swell and thigh rot. And I, I kind of thought that was like a, a picture of a miscarriage kind of thing, like mm. the rotting thigh, yeah. like something coming down the thigh. Yeah, I looked at that a while back, and it was like the thigh rotting was something having to do with the, the sexual reproductive organs of the woman shriveling up. Well, <laughs> it's the word Nepal, Nepalim falling down. Oh, yeah. The Yes. Something coming down is what I'm Yes, thinking. yes. Gravity will kick in. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Jerry? Yeah, I don't think about the jealous husband and all that stuff. If you go into, I think it's in Deuteronomy, that's about the jealous husband. Yes. Bringing his wife. Yeah. Right. He doesn't know. To make her yeah. drink that water. That's it. But yeah. then, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Water 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 water. Water. If you look at Psalm 22, yeah. it talks about the Everything that was in that jealous wife thing happened to Christ on the cross. Mm. His belly, really? his belly went down, his thighs, everything. Fascinating. Thank you. That's a great insight. Yeah. That's a fascinating insight. Wow. Good job, Jerry. <laughs> if you didn't hear that, I will repeat it. Uh, in the in the, the the interesting temple procedure of the jealous wife. Uh, if you read Psalm 22, Jerry has pointed out that there's a lot of similarities about the Messiah Yeshua having taken upon himself the curse uh, of the, the jealous wife, which makes a lot of sense. So, and I think that, that that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. No, nah, you shouldn't resist it. Don't resist the spirit. Don't resist the spirit that's right. <laughs> no, that was very good. Very good insight. Um, now I want to go briefly to uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now. These two were grafted into the tribes of Israel. Uh, very much, I mean, to the point where he says they are going to be exactly like Reuben, Reuben and Simeon, my first two, my first two born sons, uh, which is, is quite unusual. In fact, he says, uh, and any sons you have after them will be yours. But we don't know of any other sons. It seems like he didn't have any other sons. Uh, just those two. There's not any other listed in any of the genealogies. We see some sons of Ephraim and some sons of Manasseh, but we don't see any more children born to Joseph, uh, which is interesting. But one of the, one of the curious things here is um, I think that it's, it's pretty clear to me, if it's not already clear to you, that this part has been... Uh, worked over pretty good, and we've talked about it a lot. And if you're not familiar with the two sticks of Judah and Ephraim and you know, the, the, the two houses and, and stuff like that, then you should definitely look into that. Uh, I don't feel like we need to reiterate all of that here tonight because I know that many of you are familiar with that. Um, but it's, you know, it's, uh, we talked briefly before about the meanings of the names of these two sons, which is uh, forget or forgotten or something like that. And then the se- that's Manasseh, and Ephraim is fruitfulness or double fruitness or double fruit, something like that. Um, and if, th- and if, if these two sons are to be the fullness of the Gentiles, which is, is exactly what they're called, at least Ephraim, as far as I know, 
Anybody confirm that? I believe that that's this one son that it's most especially referred to as the fullness of the Gentiles. The shall the yeah, the fullness of the nations or something like that, yes. Um, then what does this mean exactly? Well, it's, it's the spiritual, I think it's most easy to say that the sons of Ephraim would become the spiritual seed of Israel. I think that's about the best way you can do it. Because you're not going to go, and I haven't really heard anybody take this path, but I'm sure there are some out there who say, oh, genetically, blood, you know, Menashe and Ephraim are secret Jews. Possibly. Who, how could you ever tell? You, you could never prove that. Uh, but spiritual seed, absolutely. Absolutely. Is it certainly possible that uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, when they got dispersed into the nations by the Assyrians uh, in like 700 BC, that they brought with them uh, some kind of hidden identity that would later be revealed through the fishers of men going and finding these lost sons of the house of Israel? Absolutely. It's certainly possible. And that, that seed could have and probably did spread into all kinds of Gentile nations all over the planet. There are British Israelite people, you know, who say that, well, the England is, is uh, the Ephraim and Manasseh, and they, they immigrated to America and Australia and New Zealand, and, man, there's tribes everywhere. It's certainly possible, but almost impossible to tell. Tracy? There's a couple of neat things, though, just to kind of point out that mm-hmm. kind of go over. This is something that Messiah showed me, too. Mm-hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. Well, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come, which is a direct quote here um, for Ephraim. The Seal shall perform the fullness of the Gentiles. But what's interesting is when Israel or Jacob saw, it says he saw the sons, but then in the next verse it says, but he couldn't see. Yeah. So it's like he's blind in part. So mm-hmm. you kind of see mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. spiritually right. yeah. speaking there, which is really yep. neat. Yep. And then later down in um, verse 16, it says, most translations don't translate it, but it actually says, and may they like the fishes increase in multitude. Mm-hmm. So yes, we do have that fishers of men type of mm-hmm. thing like you were mm-hmm. just mentioning. And he puts his right hand on Ephraim's head, and Messiah says, cast your head on the right side of the boat, and you'll collect many fish. Mm-hmm. So there's all this symbolism mm-hmm. that's relating all these things. But it yeah. does get hidden when you're not, you know, right. reading the, tra- the, the lead to the translations, too. Yeah, it's yeah. Really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, that is fascinating. Do you want to say something, Julie? Well, one of my favorite promises in the Scripture is in Isaiah 66, verse 21, where it says that people of the nations, the Goyim, that some of them he will take to be priests and Levites, mm. which is, that just blows so many people's theology of the end times if they, if they don't see the need for a temple that's coming. Mm-hmm. But the fact that a, a complete Gentile could be converted <coughs> to become a Levite, even though genetically they're not, that is quite an adoption. Well, it goes right along with what Paul said. You know, he's made us a nation of uh, kings and priests. Uh, it, it fits beautifully with the, what we know in the New Testament. Yeah, so. I understand that from um, having a brain lock. Um, Abraham gave a tithe to. Melchizedek. Yeah. And I were priest of Melchizedek. I don't have a problem with that. Oh, yeah. But, You're but talking specifically about priests and Levites. In the temple yeah. that's coming. Yeah, that's absolutely. wild. Sure, sure. And I ask, uh, I ask um, rabbis who are Orthodox or whatever, because they're all about merit, I ask them, by whose merit could this be done? And they never give me a response. It can't be on there. Right, because there isn't one. <laughs> they, yeah, they're both yeah. Messiah's grace. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think that the, you know these two boys could also be seen as um, a prophecy of the spectrum of believers. If you want to call the these two boys a a prophecy of the nations of the earth being brought into the house of Israel then the two boys' names might give you, an, uh, might give you a, uh, an example of what type of people these are going to be. Fruitful and forgetful. 
Uh, seriously, I think that there might not be a, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't take that literally, because I think we can see that very clearly, that we have uh, a broad spectrum, painting with a big brush, that, that's, that, that the body of the Messiah tends to fall into those two categories of faithful and forgetful. And I wanted to, to read to you a little section from uh, first P, or Second Peter that talks about this. And I think Peter might have been picking up on this. In, uh, in 2 Peter, verse, verses 3 through 10, it says this. Um, I'll back it up to verse 2. I apologize. Favor and peace be increased to you in the knowledge of God and of our Master Yeshua the Messiah as His mighty-like power has given to us all that we need for life and reverence through the knowledge of Him who called us to His glory and holiness. Through these there have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises so that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world by lust. And for this reason you must do your utmost to add to your faith uprightness and to your uprightness knowledge. And uh, in knowledge, temperance, and in temperance, endurance, and in endurance, godliness, and in godliness, brotherly love, and in brotherly love, even more love. For these things existing and abounding in you, notice this, make you to be neither idle nor unfruitful as regards the knowledge of our Messiah Yeshua. For he with whom these things are not present is blind short-sighted or forgetful and has forgotten the purging of his former sins. This is why the rather brethren use diligence to make your calling and election sure. For these things, for doing these things you will never fall. Do you notice that Peter used both the words unfruitful and forgetful at the in that same passage? He definitely did. I think he was picking up what's going on. He knows who his audience is. But then again, you kind of, I have been, I have been uh, mystified and puzzled on more than one occasion in studying both the books of First Peter and Second Peter because he tells you who he's writing to, doesn't he? Who's he writing to? He tells you right at the beginning of his books here. He's the elect aliens, the sojourners of the dispersion, according to the foreknowledge of God. The, yes, the, these elect sojourners. So, mixed a mixed multitude. That's what it sounds like to me. And so that's a, definitely a good tie-in with Ephraim and Manasseh. And he's seeing, you know, you be fruitful. Don't forget. What are they supposed? To, what are they supposed to not forget? The former cleansing, the former cleansing. That's a huge thing, and I think that's why we forget. We that we're so often reminded to not forget. Jerry, the dispersion of the, the dispersion. Is he talking about the Babylonian dispersion mm -hmm. or and the Syrian dispersion, or just the Babylonian dispersion? Uh, as far as I know, that the time that this book was written, the Jerusalem dispersion hadn't taken place yet, and the only dispersion prior to that where the Assyrian and the Babylonian had been one of those two. So... It goes back again to whether these people could be selected out of the, among the Gentiles who used to be of the tribes of Israel. I don't know. It's, but members of the dispersion wouldn't exactly apply to... Gentiles, pure. You have to know something about the peace and all those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But to you to say the elect who are among the dispersion, it sounds odd to say these people are among the dispersion if they're not members of the actual exile. If they're just Gentiles that he's talking to in these places, that's a rather weird salutation to say to them. It seems to be talking to actual exiles. Yes, people, he's about Absolutely. That yeah. thing, so. and that's weird too. I mean, 
Yeah, that's very weird because he, that was from the book of Hosea who's writing to the northern tribes. That's not to Jews. And then he gets into the stumbling block and you who are appointed to the truth that are now disobedient. Right, who in the former days, right. yeah, absolutely. It's kind of odd. You know, the northern tribes would consist of... Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm on board 100% with, with there being a deep mystery here in regards to the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. I, I totally am on board with that. However, there's also, we have to look at the fact that many times the disciples and Yeshua himself will quote a prophetic scripture and use it in a context which just seems incredibly foreign, just does not fit. You know what I'm saying? They do that a lot. And that's by the, infor- the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you know? There's, there's just no, you can't, you can't gainsay it. You can't come against it. It's like they're pulling out scriptures and using them in a way that just seems odd to us. I mean, we hear all of our Bible preachers, you know, bang us over the head and say, you've got to pay attention to the context. The Jews hate it when you talk about Isaiah 53 because they're looking at it in the context of this is something else other than what you say it is. And it's like, I, yeah, I understand. Oh, it can't what, be. It can't I, I know. Be. They, they don't get that, but our Messiah and his disciples did that all the time, pulling texts out of context, it seems, and just using them to apply to a situation which we would say, that doesn't exactly fit. That's what they do. That's by, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They are applying texts in a way that is either too spiritual, uh, we're, see, like this, uh, you know, Ephraim and Manasseh, how does this work? I mean, and it comes to the same thing we're going to see when he's talking about these prophecies of the tribes. I'll, behold, I'll tell you what's going to happen in the end. If all these tribes are lost to the earth, how are you going to ever know this? Nobody knows who these tribes are. What does this mean? We'll get to that in just a moment. But I think um, looking at Ephraim and Manasseh is just a, it's a spiritual journey. It's a spiritual journey. It's quite interesting, fascinating. Um, but I think it does remind us not to be forgetful, but to be fruitful. Um, the next thing is... In 48, verse 11, he says, I had not thought to, I had not thought to see you again. Uh, if you look at your Hebrew translation, uh, thought is a strange word. And I have mentioned this to you before. It's actually uh, like... Uh, heat, it's like heat palel, I think, is the Hebrew term, right. which is prayed. It's literally the word prayed. I had not prayed to see your face again. Uh, That's crazy. It, it is kind of weird, but, and, I, and I've spoken with you about this once before, but I want to bring it up again because it's such a powerful concept. And that is that when he says, I had not prayed or even thought or even imagined that I would see your face again, why is that? Because he thinks he's dead. Right. Why would you pray for something that is beyond the realm of, mm-hmm. Of, of, of possibility. But what does that teach us? We should be praying for things that seem to us beyond the realm of possibility. We definitely should be. And this is a powerful, powerful section where he says, I, hadn't even, I, couldn't, I couldn't even have imagined what was, what was going on here. And, and you know, this is, when he says, I had not thought... You, that, 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 he, that Hebrew word, uh, hit palel, also has the idea of the imagination with it. And in a, in a synagogue service, for example, when a, um, the, the, the cantor kind of guy who gets up to say the prayers, I don't remember his name, I've forgotten, uh, he gets up with, the, with the, uh, the prayer book and reads through the prayers and the congregation, you know, says certain lines and they're, they're reading through the, the, the prayers. That guy, his title is like the Imagineer. I think I've mentioned to you that before. It, it's kind of interesting. The title of this guy in the synagogue who reads from the uh, prayer book is called, is, is in Hebrew, his name means like Imagineer. And, and, this, and I have mentioned to you before how the difference between Hebrew and Christian prayer, Jewish and Christian prayer, is very different. Uh, that, that Christian prayer is often 
God help me with this, God help me with that, I need help with this, I need help with that. And that's, that's delightful, you need to ask for help. Jewish prayer is something very different, where it's, it's basically a long recitation of the greatness and the majesty and the promises of God. It's like they don't, they, they have a personal prayer time, with, you know, and you're supposed to ask God for your needs and everything, but the focus is always on giving, it's like a worship service, a true worship service, not a uh, praise service with involving music. It's, there's no music at all. What's that? It's not self-directed. No, no, it's not self-directed at all. It's a corporate worship thing where you are basically extolling the virtues of God continuously. Yeah, and they, they, and they, they call that guy the, like the Imagineer. And it's like training the people to get their minds like a conductor. Yeah, it's like training the people to get their minds in tune with who God is and what He can do and what He's capable of. And that's where this whole idea comes from. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to, what's that? Just real quick Please. On, on this. Yes. Um, you pointed out that this prayer wasn't even thought of to bring this person back into life. Yes. I don't know if you noticed that that word is just used two other places in mm -hmm. Genesis. Yeah, do you notice yeah. where? Yeah. <laughs> what did you notice? Well, it has to do with um, Abraham praying Yep. Right, and to restore the seed. Yep. Yep. Isn't that fascinating? I was. That's that's. And Joseph's mess messianic. Absolutely. That yeah. That's the that's the second part of what I was going to say about this, and Mike definitely picked up on it. Is part A is this is seriously about prayer and imagining what God can do, and it's most especially about the resurrection. I mean, it's, it, that's so clearly an idea of resurrection. Mike picked up on it. This idea, only that's, this word in its f current form only happens in two other sections of the Scripture. If you look that up and you see what those Genesis two parts 20, are, two. yeah, Genesis 20, where it's like Abraham, uh, a God appeared to Abimelech and said, Behold, you're a dead man. You know, they were cursed because he brought uh, Sarah. Uh, he's like, well, pray for the man. He's a prophet and he will heal you. Uh, you know, also, the first time, I don't know if you noticed this if you, in your readings, but um, in the middle of these blessings, there's, there's a couple of different first times here in this section. Number one is the first time that the word Yeshua is used in the Bible. It's here in Genesis 49. That's coming right up. There's fascinating stuff going on here. But what I want to I wanna, um, take a look at you with 1 Corinthians uh, 1 Corinthians has a, uh, a interesting little thing that I want to point out to you in regard to this little thing about thought. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, say 7 through 9. Yeah. Um, about what God is capable of doing in our lives and how we need to expand our imaginations a little bit. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 9. It says... We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, that hidden wisdom which God had predetermined before the ages for our glory, which none of the princes of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But according as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into a man's heart, which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed to us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. I think that's a fascinating passage. And, and also make note to yourself that Paul is quoting something else there mm -hmm. that you want to kind of go back and look at that. But I think that this brings us uh, this idea of we, we're not even equipped to see what God is capable of and is in the midst of doing in our lives. Uh, I know that Keith had brought a, uh, a book to Angela regarding, uh, what is his name, the, the rabbi guy, who's Jonathan Kahn. Uh, what was the name of that book? The Oracle. The Oracle. Has anybody read that? Was, I just basically started it, and, and it reminded me, uh, and it's this fascinating thing. This, this guy is pointing out, and I just started to do a little research because I have to see if it's true. 
because it's fascinating <laughs> whether it's true or not. I don't know, but if it's true, it's stunning. He was talking about how in 1867, Samuel Clemens, also known as Mark Twain, was writing uh, some newspaper in California had said, we'll pay, you, we'll pay your travel expenses and give you $20 per article if you'll write us a travel journal and send them back to us and we'll publish them. And he, on the last leg of his journey, went to the um, land of Israel. And that's where he wrote, and I'm sure you've heard about, uh, you know, this place is waste and desolate and there's no vegetation and this is a wasteland. Um, and also that there was at that same time, not only not the same year and not just the same month, but in the same week, in the same days that Mark Twain saying at the same hotel was a British surveyor with a measuring line who was measuring the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, What's fascinating is that Jonathan Kahn was showing you how this whole thing was orchestrated because at the same time that these two gentlemen were in the city of Jerusalem, one with a measuring line using his survey equipment to outline the old city limits of Jerusalem for the British who were interested in doing something there, uh, and Mark Twain who's walking around saying this place is desolate, Guess what Torah portion is being read in every synagogue around the world? Netzavim, in which it is said, the stranger will come to your land and pronounce, what has God done to this place? Uh, yeah. this, at He's the same time. I was like, my goodness. And, and the, the little bit of research that I did showed me that the guy who wrote the book was not being fanciful. This is actually true. And I thought, wow. That's quite interesting. What that means is, is that at the same time that these Jews in synagogues all around the world were reading this Torah portion where Moses in his last breath, was, which is also tied in with this because this is the last breath of Jacob upon his sons, the same 12 tribes that Moses will talk about at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, they're reading that Torah portion in which they're saying, in those days a stranger is going to come and say, what happened to this place? And at that very time, Mark Twain, from halfway around the world, is there writing to the rest of the people in the world. That was his best-selling. He was not known for Mark Twain and Huckleberry Finn. Innocence Abroad is what made him famous. All of these people all over the world were reading his account of the Holy Land, in which he's saying this. But he didn't know what he was saying. He had no cognizance of it. He was an irreligious man. Irreligious. Angela? I don't, I can. Uh, Samuel, well, his name is Samuel Clemens, his real name. Do you know what those words mean? Samuel. Here in L. And Clemens is clemency. Clemency, that's where we get the word clemency. God will hear and show mercy. That's what his name means. It's wow. weird, isn't it? It's like a novel. In order to do it narratively, he introduces a character who's seeing visions, and so you know, don't trip over that. But the, it's, it's interesting. The, the facts he introduces. The kernel of it is. Yeah, is, yeah. Yes. It's just he's couched it in a in a fictitious narrative in order to portray the ideas, which is it's quite fascinating. That's how he does all his books, like yeah. Harbinger. Okay. Same thing, and he goes back. It's more current. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't read I haven't read any of his stuff. This is the first time this is the first time that I've ever read anything. <laughs> anyway, yes, Larry. You talk about being a vast wasteland, the promised land, and when the the vote became up to the United Nations, I I can't remember the exact count of what it was. England abstained, and we confirmed, but, but the, the nations that said, well, give it to the Jews anyways, because nothing will ever grow here. Mm -hmm. This will be desolate. Mm -hmm. So in a way, they're going to kill themselves. Sure. We don't have to worry about Hitler accomplishing what he wanted, because they'll just die mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So that was their out, that was their point of view. Mm -hmm. If they voted positively, some of the nations sure yeah. falls right in line with it. No, I agree. I agree. But yeah. Everything. And now they're the biggest exporter uh -huh. in Asia. Yeah. Of and agriculture. Yeah, yeah. Everything is good there except for the water. And Messiah will fix that. Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, you don't really know what God is capable of doing. I mean, I began to think about how, you know, Mark Twain needed to be at the right place at the right time, pronouncing the right words, and some guy from England needed to be at the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, and lined up with, and it just made me think, man, is there a whole other world out there that's happening that's like the real world and we're living in some kind of alternate reality where it's like we're actually the fish in the bubble? It's, that's what a lot of people have said, and I think that's a fairly decent way to look at it. Is this reality? I don't know that it is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's like the Matrix. Well, and it's a, yes, it's like the Matrix. I think that's that's a fascinating euphemism, uh, and I think also you know you look at examples of like uh, the the servant uh, with uh, Elisha. You know, it's like God says to him, "Open his eyes so that he can actually see what's right. going on." It's like that's what we need to have is our eyes open so that we can really see what's happening. Gracie. Well, our kids need to see. They don't know what's real and what isn't. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, we need to talk about these things. We need to talk about them with our family and friends. And, and it, it's tough, though, because I know that you can come off as a kooky person, you know, when you start talking to some of the youngsters. They're like, oh, my goodness. How do I shut this hole? How do I shut the hole on this thing? It won't stop talking. <laughs> I, I understand. And you just, you know, sometimes the time is right and sometimes the time is not right. Yeah. And God softens the heart as the need arises. So keep that in mind. Um, now, you know, it says that he blessed Joseph. He didn't actually bless Joseph. He blessed Joseph's sons. And I think that there's a principle there as well. Joseph didn't need anything from his father. He's, the, he's like the prime minister of Egypt. He's probably fabulously wealthy. He has a high position of authority. And it says his father blessed him, but how did he bless him? He blessed him by blessing his sons. Yeah. And I think that's a, such a good picture, and I think we even talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. It's like, you know, God will himself say to you in the Tanakh, I don't have any need for anything that you have. I own the, a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need anything from you. If you want to, do something for me, do it for my children. Do it for each other. And you get this passage, and I just want to make a note of that you take a look at Matthew 10, 40, uh, where the Messiah says, if you even give a cup of cold water to one of these, my disciples, I'll consider that you've done it for me. Yeah. And that, I think, is the big takeaway here, is that you know, Jacob is blessing Joseph by blessing his children. And I think that's a good metaphor for God and the Messiah Yeshua saying, I don't need anything from you. If you want to love me and you want to keep my commandments, love your brothers and sisters. And I think that there's a huge thing that's happening here, that, and this is prophetic as well, where we start with the family of Jacob hating each other and selling each other into slavery. And it's, it's terrible. They're backbiting and turning on each other. And at the end, they come together. They, there is forgiveness. There is unity. They're going down to Egypt, the womb that is going to birth them as a unified whole. And there is a prophetic picture there of the family of God needing to go from backbiting and stabbing each other and talking trash about each other and wanting to sell each other into slavery to becoming a family unit and able to function to be birthed into the world. Tracy? Mm -hmm. which one he actually mm -hmm. refers to them as his little ones. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Angela? Um, you were saying that uh, we can't 
give him anything that he doesn't already have. Mm -hmm. But what he wants us to do is love each other. I think that he set it up so that we could participate. That's like our opportunity to participate. It's mm -hmm. not that he needs us to do that. It's here is this opportunity I've given you to participate in my plans mm -hmm. so that you and this is what you can do. Yes. A family business. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He's still going to do what he needs to, to get done. But Would you like to join me? Yeah. I'm working on something here. You want to get involved in this. There's good blessings for being involved in it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we need to continuously get better at uh, loving one another. That's, yeah. It's so hard. It's so hard to, to love people. And what's sad is he probably gave us the easiest thing. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean, the easiest thing? He probably made it super easy. He probably gave us the easiest way to participate. He didn't say, you have to die on the cross like I do. Right. He, he didn't say, Virtually you have do. to like, give up your stuff. Yeah. But he's just going to be nice to each other. Yeah. But he that's... He gave us the easiest job possible uh, 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 to participate, and we still find it. No, we don't have to so suffer. Hard. Yeah, well, you know, we have to suffer each other. And you know what? I People are weird, man. People are weird, and they're whacked out, and it is hard to love each other. You guys are hard. It's going to be hard for me to love Pelosi. No, I, you know what? Just stop it. Stop it. Mike, were you going to say something? Okay, Tracy. Yeah. And no one ever hated his own flesh. And it's, I think mean, there's other references about eating flesh, eating much flesh. So it's like, that's what we're doing. We're devouring ourselves. Devouring each other, yes. You know? Absolutely. And I think when Messiah talks about cutting off the hand, lest it be thrown into the hellfire, I think it's spiritually speaking, it's about the body. Yeah. You know, not yeah. letting that love and permeate the body. Yeah. That's tough, man. That's tough. We need to think of each other mm -hmm. as members of one body, but that's really hard to do. It really is hard to do. I think we've got to make a decision to be radical. Yes. I think here's, here's two things that I would suggest to you that, well, three things. Number one, the easiest thing, but it does take time and diligence and patience, is to pray for one another. You don't have to actually put up with one another to pray for one another. That's the easiest thing, is to actually pray for one another. Now, I don't know what your prayer lives are like. That's secret stuff, okay? I don't know how many times a day you pray or for how long. But I will say, if you don't have a list of the people and the needs that are represented by your faith community, you're falling down on the job. You need to know who these people are and what they need. You know what I'm saying? That's why I put them up on the board here every week, and that's why we have a prayer sheet that goes around uh, through email string, because if you don't know what the needs are of the people around you, there's no excuse other than you don't care. If you you have to ask, you have to care enough to ask. How are you doing? And you know what? We also have to be truthful. When somebody says how you doing, they don't want to hear how your week was or how you're Pretty enjoying good. the weather. Now, but that doesn't mean that we need to spew about all the terrible challenges that we have in our lives, but it might just a little bit. You don't need to give details, but you might say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. We have to be willing to share a little bit of vulnerability with each other. Nobody likes that. And we have to care enough to ask. So that's step number one is praying for each other. We have to get real in order to do that, or we don't really know what to pray for. Uh, number two is talking about each other, talking trash. I know it happens. <laughs> I know it happens. We love each other. Gossip. Gossip is a killer. Gossip is a killer. I know that none of you would do that, but it, but it happens. It's like murder. It is like murder. It's like the, the Torah says it's like standing in your brother's blood. I, you know... The Rabbi Chofetz Chaim said, you should just never speak about someone unless they're standing next to you, period. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad idea. 
unless you're unless you're speaking praise. But you know, if there's anything, you know, if it just happens, and we need to be very careful of it. And the third thing is to be charitable with one another. If we have a need uh, to help each other, but we won't. If we don't get to know each other, and we don't ask each other how we're doing and what do you need, they won't even know, and people will suffer in silence, and that's just not good. It's not good at all. Yes. On the first point, prayer for pray for people yeah. in need. So when did when do they go off your prayer list? When never. They recover? Never. Never. Uh, the, uh, not on my list. My list is complete and whole and accurate. <laughs> it's still there. Okay. That doesn't mean that I don't you know put a check mark next to it or something and you know to say that person's need has been met, but it's still on my list. Still there, I mean, because just that's just my list. So, but I mean, we have that. Pray repeatedly. I pray continuously. The Bible says, yeah, "Absolutely." And sometimes you don't know what to say, and that's when the Spirit comes along and helps our weaknesses, right? Because mm-hmm. we don't know what to say, and I don't think that means pray in tongues. I think that means your spirit is communing with God in such a way that you know what to say. The Spirit is interceding for you on your behalf. I think sometimes it's where it's like this self the Lord about it. And I don't know, and I tell him I don't know, and I just be quiet for a few minutes. Yeah. And he'll bring it into my mind, either through a Christian song or through a, a verse that I've read somewhere or whatever way. Sure. My problem is taking the time to be quiet and listen. Taking the time to be quiet in the culture and in the life that we have in these days is very challenging. It very much is. Tracy? That's something that I, I always forget, but I was talking to my dad about that once, and he was just really thinking about prayer and how how would you feel if, you know, you walked up to, like, your dad or something, and you're just like, blah, 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 and ask him all these questions, that's what I was hoping, then you left. <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah. wait. Wait upon the Lord, and it's in the Bible. Yeah. Here, you know? Wow. <laughs> yeah. So how, how often, I'm guilty of this, I forget to do it. Yeah. You know, sitting, yes, receiving, a receiving a response. a response from God can be facilitated by sitting quietly. It won't, you know, for a lot of people, it might be reading His Word. You know, meditating upon His Word because that's the way He speaks to us mostly. Is what I'm aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, there's parts of the Bible I just don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being honest, Jimmy. Oh, there's a scripture that says, uh, by faith the justified shall live. Yes. yes. That's right. The other way around. <laughs> That's right. Shall live. That's right. Well, fascinating, isn't it? Um, now, you know, he says here that Israel is going to bless, and this has been happening for millennia every Friday night, you know, when the Jews get together for a Shabbat dinner on Friday evening. They bless their children, you know, they put their hands over their children and they say, may the Lord make you like Ephraim to Manasseh. Um, you know, they, the, in, according to Hebrew tradition, these two sons were not necessarily chosen uh, because they were fruitful, although that is a, a, a big part of the blessing. It's to make you fruitful like Ephraim and Manasseh. But more importantly, these two sons, according to tradition, loved each other, mm-hmm. that they were they got along, uh, which is which is slightly unusual in the family of Jacob. <laughs> but you know that speaks to what we've been talking about. You know, with brotherly love. Now, why they would say make to, to the young ladies, they say make you like uh, Leah, Rachel, and Leah. They hated each other. They were scratching each other's eyes out. Uh, so, <laughs> does that that only don't extrapolate too far from that? <laughs> but. Um, I think that, you know, yeah, if, you, if you're blessing like Ephraim and Manasseh, make you fruitful, that can mean a spiritual fruitfulness, I think, absolutely applies. Uh, but being in, in brotherly, united in brotherly love is, is probably also a big part of that. Angela? Sometimes the 
forget that's a blessing mm -hmm. until yeah. you remember that it's not like that all the time. No. No. I have been stunned and amazed because I had the same type of relationship with my sister. I mean, we, we didn't hate each other that bad, but we certainly didn't get along. And there were times when it was quite challenging. But my two sons actually like each other, and they right. hang out together. It's the weirdest thing. You just you don't see that very often. Uh, it's very unusual. Well, that's something that we really need to, I really need to embrace and think about, this, how the literal teaches the spiritual, because like, mm. I, can, I know what that broken relationship feels like with my own brother, and that's mm. how it hurts my parents. And how, it's not me and him, it's him against everybody, but <laughs> it, it hurts the whole family. It does. So we can think about that within the body of Messiah and how that hurts yeah. the whole family. It hurts God. It hurts you. It hurts me. We need to yep. try to repair that and think yeah. about the brothers and sisters that actually get along. It's a beautiful thing when you see it and how much it places the parents, right? Yeah. And, and I hope... I hope that you know you grew out of that, and most a lot of people do. They may not have a very close relationship with their sibling, but they don't really hate each other anymore. Hopefully, that's just we don't a try to beat each other up. no. We, yeah, I mean, I I love my sister, and we get along fine. Uh, you know, even though we don't have a lot in common, we're not really close. I you know I love my sister, and we get along fine, and I'm sure most of you do as well. Hopefully, um, but yeah, it's 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 a real it's a real blessing. Um, there's no guarantees. No, there's not. Uh, so now in Genesis 49, we have, Behold, I will tell you what will happen to you in the end. Now this is where things definitely get crazy. And here I'm going to move forward just a little bit and talk about, um, in relation to the tribes, um, I kind of mentioned to you that, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot that I can tell you about this. I mean, these, these quote-unquote blessings of the tribes are not always seeming like a blessing. Uh, some of them are flat out, sound like curses. Uh, but you know, I would point out, in, just in relation to this first, uh, this first one, and this is a, a good point that I would make to you uh, in Genesis 49. It says, regarding the firstborn and the secondborn son, he kind of lumps them together. Uh, and he says, Reuben, in verse 3, Genesis 49, 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my vigor. Uh, so he, he basically says, yeah, you're awesome, except you slept with my concubine. Your, your sexual immorality, in verse uh, 4, you went up to your, fa my father, your father's couch. You defiled my couch. Reuben decided to sleep with one of his father's concubines. Now that might seem like, was this kid just a weird sexual pervert? Uh, I don't think so. I think that what that is actually a reference to is, uh, you remember when, when David's son rebelled against him yeah. and he took his, wife's con his, his father's concubines and slept with them all in public? on the top of the palace or something in Jerusalem. I think that at some point Reuben was trying to overthrow his father and that he decided that he was going to, as an act of defiance against his father and saying, I am taken over, uh, that that's what he did. I don't know that this was just an, a, an episode of no. sexual immorality because this power is... Play. It was a power play is what it certainly seems like to me. You know, we don't know anything about that. It literally, there's one little sentence in like Genesis uh, 21 or 22 or something like that where this thing is mentioned, and it's literally, Jacob doesn't say anything about it. He doesn't do anything about it, apparently. I don't know how it was resolved, but this sin of rebellion and defiance against his father was not forgotten. It came back to bite him later. Angela? Mm. Take, take the father's wife and make his own offspring. Mm -hmm. These sons were really angry about what happened with Dina. Yeah. And Shechem. And so, I mean, it's not like they didn't value the significance of this act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know that, uh, you know, 
each of these sons, and we're only given glimpses of certain of them, we know that Judah had a change of heart, and we talked about that last time, you know, because we see him coming up with the idea of selling uh, Joseph into slavery, but then we also see him making a, having a big change of heart and a turnaround in his attitude later on. Well, we see something similar uh, with Reuben, because it was Reuben whose idea it was to save Joseph from the wrath of his brothers who were trying to kill him. Uh, and so it seems like each of them probably made some type of a journey towards becoming faithful, becoming loving, becoming kind. Uh, but Reuben, he screwed it up, for sure. Uh, and if you look at Simeon and Levi, for example, uh, he says here that, that the biggest problem with them is their anger, their violence, because these are the two boys who came up with the plan to slaughter the Shechemites. Yes. And according to rabbinic tradition, these are also the two brothers who came up with the idea to murder Joseph, but that Judah saved him from their hands by coming up with an alternate plan, which is to just sell him into slavery. Um, but you notice what he says here in verse 7, Cursed be their anger. Not cursed be them. Yeah. Cursed be their anger. Okay, that's, that's a big, big thing when, we're, when we are noting the shortcomings and shortfalls of someone else. And we, we put our finger on the bad behavior rather than the person themselves. It's such a huge thing because that play of words is so powerful. Words are powerful. You know, I know we've always heard the expression sticks and stones, but that's not exactly true. Words are incredibly powerful. And when you, when you make comments about someone instead of their behavior, that's a big thing. It's a really big thing. And I think Jacob you know, gives us a, a good demonstration of this. He says, cursed be their anger, not cursed be them. Angela? Yeah. And I don't know if you were, were, you had, were you going to say something else about Levi? Because I know we both heard this. Go ahead. That um, Le Levi was the tribe that didn't participate in the golden calf event, but then Levi is also in this thing as being kind of a bloodthirsty one, this, this Simeon. And that coincidentally, the, the tribe is going to be in charge of slaying animals day yeah. in and day out. Yeah. The Well, and he strapped on his sword and killed yeah, he, his he own family that. members when the, when the incident of the golden calf. He was apparently bloodthirsty. And yes. however, his bloodthirstiness was turned into zealousness for God, mm -hmm. uh, he turned into service. which was in turn turned into service because he became the family of the Levites. Uh, yeah, it's a quite interesting yeah. metamorphosis and change. But, they're not described as being ruddy or red yeah. the way Esau was. So right. it's something different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, so I just want to point out to you a couple of things regarding a couple of these tribes, okay? And I think that we should go ahead and look at Judah and Ephraim, and Judah and Joseph, as, as being prime exemplars of the tribes because we don't know if... This is so weird because he says, I'll tell you what's going to happen in the end. And that literally is Akarit Hayamim, which is in the end days, which is so weird to us because of what we know about these 10 lost tribes, which is basically diddly squat. We know nothing. We know, have no idea where they are. Uh, so him saying, behold, I'll tell you these mysteries. We don't even know where these people are or who they are. They seem to have disappeared from history like 2,400, 600 years ago. This, this prophecy doesn't make a lot of sense. And there's, there's not a lot of information regarding the tribes in some of the histories of the, the Old Testament, whether it's the book of Judges or the, the Kings or the Chronicles. There's some nuggets there, and you can get some hints, but that's a big, big, long study. Um, but if you're interested in that, I definitely recommend you dig into it, but it's, 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 uh, it's mysterious. And so all I can say is, 
Let's look at the two chief ones because two of the sons received very big, long blessings. Some of them received like a sentence, you know, like Benjamin. He's a ravenous wolf. What else can I say about the guy? You know, and then there's Judah and, and, and if, uh, Joseph. They received the biggest, longest blessings. Joseph, the longest one. And Judah, the next longest. Jimmy? Um, yeah, I had so many thoughts. I forgot what I was thinking at the time. Think about it more. Let's just move forward. I want to read to you the blessing of Judah uh, from which we get the monarchy and the law preserver. And I know you guys are familiar with this, but we'll deal with it just a little bit. He says in Genesis 49, starting in verse 8, uh, Yehuda, your brothers will acknowledge you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Yehuda is like a lion's cub. My son, you stand over the prey. He crouches down and stretches like a lion, like a lioness who dares to provoke him. The scepter will not pass from Yehuda nor the ruler's staff from between his legs until Shiloh come, and it is he whom the peoples will obey, tying his donkey to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice grape vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Now this is a, uh, there are, I got to tell you that just translating the Hebrew into English in this whole section is also fraught with difficulty. You can see that this translation from the complete Jewish Bible may be very different than, than what you are reading in your translation. Um, but a couple of points that I would point out to you. Judah is the tribe of monarchy. Most of the kings that will last for any time. I mean, yes, we had a series of kings in the northern kingdom once they broke away and they kind of had a civil war. Uh, we had the ten tribes in the north and the two tribes approximately in the south. Um, you have Judah that continues for an additional 150 years. Uh, but, you know, who was the first king of Israel united? Excuse me? Saul. Saul. Now, there's something quite interesting about that. And I heard one of the rabbis say, uh, I was reading, and he said that Saul was not actually a legitimate king of Israel. And I thought, well, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't Benjamin. comport with my experience of having read of what happens. And, you know, God said, he pointed out to him and he's anointed his head. But, you know, I began to look at it a little bit more closely and I discovered, you know, it actually says that this is the king they have chosen, not the king I have chosen. Which is quite fascinating because then you kind of get into this whole picture of Saul is very, very like an antichrist. Very. Very much like an antichrist. He is plagued with demons. And he tries to persecute the anointed one, the, the, the actual messianic figure. Uh, he is not exactly righteous, doesn't have a whole lot of righteous behavior that you can see in the text. He's consulting with mediums to talk to the dead. Uh, he's making unrighteous decrees and judgments. And I th began to think about it a little bit and say, golly, this is kind of interesting. Um, that it, 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 right at the beginning, you can see that God does seem to be saying, this is your choice. You have rejected me. And you can see that Samuel the prophet was unhappy about this. And he is, I don't think it was because he himself was enjoying the rulership of the tribes as a judge and that he didn't want to give it up to this guy. I don't think that's what it was. He basically, God told him, don't worry, they're, you know, they're rejecting me. They, and they were. They were rejecting God as their king, and they were saying, we want, they said, we want a king like the other nations. Exactly what they said. And when it says how he was selected, he says, isn't this the man that you have chosen? God did not choose him. And I think there's a very real possibility that Saul is presented to us as an anti-messianic type of figure. And yet Samuel was, was really sad when <coughs> it went over to David. He, mm -hmm. he was... 
he had high Perfect. hopes for he had high, high hopes for Saul. He definitely does. Uh, and you see, you know, what, there's just so many weird occurrences with Saul. I mean, he's when they gather together at Mizpah, he's like a foot taller than all the other people. It's like, look at this guy. He's striking and he's powerful and he's handsome. But where is he at when they first when we first come into contact with him? He's hiding. He's hiding among the baggage. When all the men of Israel are gathering for war, he is cowering in fear among the baggage. There's something... I'm not saying that is. I'm just saying that he's, he seems to be behaving as a coward. He's not... He doesn't seem to be acting like a man. It's curious. Very curious. I don't know. He's a most weird figure. I can... Right, right, and then you have such a direct comparison with with uh, you know when 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 Samuel goes to the sons of Yeshai and is like, oh, it's got to be this one. Look at how handsome he is, and he's like, no. Come to some kid with you know red hair and freckles is like him. It makes me think of Arrested Development. Her. <laughs> he, he made such a big deal when he anointed Saul. It was a big production, and yeah. he was like, we're gonna do this. And then he gets to David, he basically just throws some oil on his head. Goes, Good luck, guy. It's you know? done it's done in secret. And he it's done blessed. and and it and it grows. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's in fifteen minutes and yeah. it's out. It's very different. Jerry? Because you said he was a coward in the very beginning, he was a coward right up at the end. Because he tried to get somebody else to run a sword to him because he didn't want to die by the hand of the enemy. Yeah. He finally fell on his own sword and yeah. standing out with Goliath. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Yes. Can't be me. That's right. That's right. Very interesting. Anyway, so the, and I'm sure there's some propaganda on the part of Jews who might say Saul was not a legitimate king, and David is. You know, I I, I get it. He's from the tribe of Judah. Angela. Just out of curiosity, what tribe was Saul from? Benjamin. A ravenous wolf, yes, absolutely. Which is interesting when you come to the New Testament picture. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Did you think about the, the rabbi Shaul from the New Testament? We talked about this one, who was also from the tribe of Benjamin. It's almost like you come full circle where you've got Saul, who seems like a good guy, but then he goes downhill into this weird, twisted, demonic, trying to destroy God's anointed to, to the same guy being born 2,000 years later in the person of Saul of Tarsus, who's hating and trying to destroy the messianic right. figure, and all of a sudden he becomes a sheep. It's a, wow. it's a perfect picture, it's just a menorah picture of some good guy who turns evil to turns good. Yeah, it's weird. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead a little bit to just this last little thing really quick. And that is what happens in Genesis chapter 50 where Joseph um, goes to bury his father. And I want to I wanna just kind of read this for you, and, and you can think about this from a prophetic s- standpoint. It says in Genesis 50, starting in like verse uh, 7, So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went all of Pharaoh's servants, the leaders of his household, and the leaders of the land of Egypt, along with the entire household of Joseph, his brothers and his father's household, Only their little ones, their flocks, and their cattle did they leave in the land of Goshen. Moreover, there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very large caravan. When they arrived at the threshing floor of Atad, beyond the Jordan River, they raised a loud and bitter lamentation, mourning for his father seven days. When the local inhabitants, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the floor of Atad, they said, How bitterly the Egyptians are mourning. This is why the place was given the name Avel Mitzrayim, the mourning or the meadow of Egypt. Uh, There beyond the Jordan, his sons did to him as he ordered them to do. They carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, which Avraham had brought along with the field as a burial place belonging to him from Ephron the Hittite by Mamre. You notice, this, this seems just weird and prophetic to me. It's such an unusual picture of what's happening here. A couple of things that come to my attention. One, we have 
the leaders, the leadership of the, all of, it's seemingly all of the leadership and the key nobles and powerful families of Egypt transporting this dead body of Jacob to the land of Egypt along with Joseph and his brothers. They leave their, la- their children and their cattle in the land of Egypt, which is very interesting in itself. Mm-hmm. And then ev- the whole retinue has a, some kind of a weird mourning period for 30 days on the other side of the Jordan River, and then only the sons of Israel cross the Jordan River and take their father and bury him in the cave of Machpelah, and then they come back. Just Does that not just seem odd to you? I, I think that there's some prophecy here. I, it, it made me think of this other passage. And the passage is this, from Isaiah chapter 49. The day will come when the children born when you were mourning will say to you, this place is too cramped for me. Give me room so I can live. And then you will ask yourself, who fathered these for me? I've been mourning my children alone as an exile, wandering to and fro. So who has raised these? I was left alone. So where have these come from? Yuvah Elohim answers, I am beckoning to the nations, raising my banner to the peoples. For they will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their shoulders. Kings will be your foster fathers, their princesses your nurses. They will bow to you, face toward the earth, and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am Yehovah. Those who wait for me will not be sorry. Does this strike you? Kings will be your foster fathers and princesses your nurses? What does that remind you of? Moses, yes, it reminds me of Moses where the princess of Egypt takes him into her family. And and then you've got kings will be your foster fathers. That's what Joseph was. It says God has made Pharaoh, has made me like a father to Pharaoh. Uh, Fascinating. And it it makes me think of this this being almost like a prophetic regathering of the, it's almost like a second exodus if you guys have heard this kind of theory Uh, promulgated out there that I think that there may be some truth to this idea of a second exodus uh, about the people being restored to the land by other people, by other nations. And I think this might be a prophetic shadow picture of that. And I think it's fascinating also that only the sons of Israel cross the Jordan to enter into the promised land. The Egyptians stay on the other side of the river, which is interesting which is quite interesting. Why did they stay? Why did only the sons of Jacob cross the river? Don't know. But I think it's prophetic. Uh, Any comments, questions, or concerns? Let's pray and eat.